أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ديفيو السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته In this series for the holy month of Ramadan We've been discussing the benefits of the Holy Qur'an, the benefits that you and I can gain and take from the Holy Qur'an, as well as discussing ethical principles from the most beautiful story in the Qur'an, the best of stories, the story of the Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him. Before we delve into the story once again, I wanted to mention a couple of traditions with regards to the Qur'an. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, says that the Qur'an is rich. There is no richness and riches after the Holy Qur'an and there is no poverty after it. It's not possible that somebody has the Qur'an and feels poor and neither is it that somebody has the Qur'an and feels that they don't have all the riches of the world. It is extremely rich in the sense that if one has it and understands it, they don't need anything else. Why don't they need anything else? They don't need anything else because it's a book of guidance. It's a book that will make you into a true human being. A human being that is satisfied with what you have. Not a human being who is running around left and right, attracted to pretty much everything, trying to gain more and more and be more greedy. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, went on Mi'raj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, Oh Ahmad, don't be like these individuals who are attracted by every yellow and green thing. Individuals who are attracted by everything on the earth and everything in the skies. Something glitters and all of a sudden we begin to run after it. That's not why the human being has been created. The human being should be satisfied and understand that their entire life is in the hands of Allah. So long as they are conforming to two requirements, then everything that comes to them is good. The first of it is that they are doing everything that's incumbent upon them. And the second is that they're staying away from everything which has been prohibited to them. When we begin to make ourselves into individuals who adhere to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we know that out of His love and generosity, He will look after us and take great care of us. i give you an example. If you knew that your parents had a blank check and were writing the future of your life, you would not be worried. Because you trust your parents totally. You realize that they will only write what's good for you. And they will write something that you love too. That is of benefit to you. Because they know you very well. Now understand that Allah is greater than them. And that Allah knows you better than they know you. Better than you know yourself. And if you trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the whole of your life is in his hands. And what he's writing can only be good for you. It may not be what you want. And this is where we have to understand there's a difference between what is good for us and what sometimes we want. Allah will not simply give us everything we want. A young child, how many sweets do you give them? You give them a few, but you have a time when you stop because you realize that it's not good for them. Even if they want it, it's not good for them. The adult is no different. Sometimes the adult wants fame and Allah stops him or her from gaining that fame Because that fame will make them go astray, will get to their head, they'll become proud. Sometimes an adult wants money, wants wealth, and Allah gives them, but only in a limited fashion. Because if they are given more wealth, then they're going to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a beautiful story of an individual who went to the haram of the 8th holy imam, Imam al-Radha alayhi salam. And he asked the imam for a particular desire that he wanted. He thought it was good for him, so he would ask the imam on a regular basis. And this is something we should do. We should ask through the imams. We should ask directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we feel that what we're asking for is good for us. 
But at the end, we should always make it very clear that, oh Allah, make it clear to ourselves that, oh Allah, only give this to me if it's good for me. And if you don't give it to me, give me the wisdom to understand why you're not giving it to me. So this individual went to the holy shrine of the Imam. He kept asking for this desire and it wasn't being given to him. So then he went to a mystic who is buried in the sahan, in the courtyard of the holy Imam. He stood by his grave and he said, oh man, the Imam is not listening to me. So I've heard that the ulama can also do shifa'a, the ulama can also intercede. So I'm asking you to please ask God that this is the desire I have. Please ask God to give it to me. Very quickly, within a couple of days, he was given what he was asking for. So he became very sad. He thought to himself that the eighth holy Imam is not listening to him. But this alim was willing to listen and intercede for him. After a few days, he realized that what he had asked for was actually very detrimental to him. It wasn't good for him. And that's when he realized that the Imam wasn't giving him for a reason. So he went to the grave of this alim, of this scholar. He stood by the grave and he said, Oh man, oh scholar, when you don't know when to give, don't give. In the same way, when we call to Allah, He's made it a command in the Quran. Ud'uni astajib lakum. You ask, ask, I command you to ask and I will answer. He will answer. But the answer doesn't necessarily have to be yes. You will give, get what you ask for. The answer can be yes. The answer can be no. And the answer can be not yet. Even if he says no, he has still answered. But he has answered by saying no for a reason. Remember, it doesn't increase God in anything if He keeps away from you what you've asked for. Neither does it deplete Him when He gives you what you've asked for. One of the most important parts in this surah, and one of the principles that we need to act upon on a regular basis, is what happens in the prison. As Yusuf goes into prison, and two individuals come with him, they mention to him that you seem to be of the good doers. We've had these dreams. Can you please interpret them for us? Verse 37. Then Yusuf says that I shall interpret them for you before your food comes to you. Every day they would be given food to eat in the prison. Yusuf says before the food comes to you, I will, I will interpret it for you. Meaning that he is certain that he knows the interpretation. He will interpret it for them. And he'll interpret it within a particular time frame. He is now in control of the situation. He says, before your food comes, I will interpret it for you. But here is where Yusuf السلام, does something extremely important. He takes the opportunity of that time with two individuals who want something from him. He says, I'll give you, but first I want something from you. I don't want you to give me something. I simply want you to le lend me your ears so that I, I can propagate this religion to you. I can propagate Tawheed to you. And he tells them about how Inni taraktu la billah. I have left a community that did not worship and did not obey Allah and not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with regards to the next life, there were individuals who did not accept it and rejected it. I am following and I have followed the progeny on the, the path of my grandfathers, Ibrahim and Ishaq and Yaqub. And he talks to them about Tawheed and about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He propagates. He takes that opportunity to propagate his religion, the religion of Tawheed, to these individuals who are lost. There is a principle in here that you and I need to accept. We need to accept, we need to act upon as well. The Prophet, peace be upon him, mentions that it is an obligation upon every Muslim man and every Muslim woman to seek knowledge. It's your duty, my duty, his duty and her duty to go forth and learn this religion of ours. Not simply to wait for the religion to come to us. Not simply to only understand what has come to us from the religion. But to exert effort and go and learn this religion to a certain level. Not everybody has to go to a high level. Not everybody has to go to an extremely deep level. But everybody has to exert effort to understand this religion to a certain level. 
such that they may be able to propagate this religion. And propagation of the religion is in two methods. The first is through speech. The first is through teaching people about God, informing people about the path of the Ahlul Bayt We have neighbors, for example. We've lived next to our neighbors, some of us, for tens of years, 20 years, 50 years. Yet these neighbors still do not know a true vision of Islam and an interpretation of Islam. They see what they see in the media as Islam. It's your duty and my duty to correct it. We have a requirement and a duty to speak to them, to inform them about this religion, to tell them that we do not accept what you may be seeing on TV. This is not Islam. True Islam is X and Y. Invite them to your houses. Show them the type of family you are. Show them how you treat your children and your spouse. Let them learn Islam, one, through your speech. But secondly, as the Ahlul Bayt say, they say, call unto us through your actions without your speech. It doesn't have to be through your speech, through your actions, because actions speak louder than words. When your neighbors see how respectful you are of them, when your neighbors see how you treat your family, how you speak well to your spouse, how you speak kindly to your children, how you love them, naturally they will be inclined towards that which is making you act in this manner. Remember the Holy Prophet used to emphasize on the rights of a neighbor so much that Amir al-Mu'mineen said we thought that he would include them in the wasiyah, in the will of an individual. That's how much respect he was giving to one's neighbors. We have a duty, not only within the four walls of our mosque to do tabligh, to propagate, but even outside. When we go to ziyara, when we go for hajj, it's easy to become embarrassed as to where we're going. It's easy not to tell our colleagues, our uh, places of work, people who are at the places of work. It's easy not to tell them where we're going and hide it from them. Instead, we need to be individuals who are proud of our religion. Individuals who are not apologetic about where we're going and why we're going. Individuals who want to speak about Hussein, who want to speak about Zainab, who want to speak about Mecca and Medina want to inform people of where we're going, why we're going, and what change it take, makes within us. Some people may not understand in today's environment why we will uproot ourselves for two weeks and go for Arba'een, for example. It's a perfect time to inform them what Hussein stood for and the mission of Hussein that we wish to continue until today. If we can learn anything from this part that Yusuf was in prison, it's that we should seize every opportunity to propagate our religion to other people, the religion of God, the religion of Tawheed, and the path of the Ahlul Bayt We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us steadfast on the path of the Ahlul Bayt We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the 12th Holy Imam, and that when the Imam reappears, we shall be able to understand who he is. Finally, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if we are not meant to be alive, when he reappears, then we pray that someone from our progeny becomes of his choicest companions and through that individual's actions we shall enter into paradise with the Imam. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.